Hey there, folks. I'm Jeremy Siskind, and uh, thanks to all of you who have already bought my book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano. I love getting the orders uh, to my website. It just makes me very happy. So thanks to all of you who have bought it already. Uh, if you haven't, I'll see your name on that website soon. Today's subject is guide tone lines, and I feel like guide tone lines are this thing in jazz education that people talk about, but then nobody really knows what it means or what to do with it. Um, so if that's you, then I have some practice ideas for you and maybe some explanation that will help. Um, and I think hopefully you'll learn some ways to get really creative about guide tone lines that maybe other people haven't taught you. So that's the goal with the lecture today. So here we go. Oh, I shouldn't call it a lecture. That's such bad YouTube etiquette. That's the goal of this fun video. <laughs> um, okay, so guide tone lines, the general idea is that you're trying to find linear horizontal ways to connect between chord changes. So um, there are several intervals that classically work. And sometimes in jazz, edu jazz education, when people talk about guide tone lines, they simply mean these lines that connect the third to the seventh to the third. And this will connect beautifully if you're in a two, five, one, or if you're in any sort of a circle of fifths progression. So what you're seeing there is the, the blue numbers are just showing you uh, what the what chord tone is. So, uh, you've probably heard this before. This shouldn't be news to too many people out there. Three, connecting to seven, connecting to three, right? And these are important, useful lines because they either stay the same or they move by step and most commonly by half step and more on that to come. Um, so there's three to seven to three or seven to three to seven. Okay. Um, and so these are two of the biggest connectors. They're right at the heart of the harmony. Um, now, I have these three ways that I like to practice these guide tone lines. This is kind of step two. The first one is to practice hitting these guide tone lines on or near the downbeat. So uh, you can see the red circle notes are the third to seventh to third guide tone line. So I'm hitting. And so this kind of gives me guideposts to aim for as I'm uh, working on using that guide tone line. And I say on or near the downbeat because in jazz so frequently we anticipate to the end of four, or we might even delay to the end of one, so. Right, so we still really hear the guide tones prominently even if we're anticipating the downbeat. The second one is to use the guide tone lines as the top notes of your phrase. And so here it could start anywhere. So you could see that here in this first measure, uh, the guide tone line is on the end of two, and then the second measure is also on the end of two, and then the next one it comes in early on the end of four. Um, so. Um, and this is related to a, a concept that Charlie Parker uses a lot called compound melody. And compound melody is where you have a melody that could be played by a single line instrument, just one note at a time, but it implies another melody. For example, you guys might be familiar with blues for Alice. Beautiful example of a compound melody. Um, it's this single note melody, but we hear, we hear these notes connecting in there. before Charlie Parker, Bach is certainly a you know, master of compound melody. So what we're doing when we use the guide tone lines in any way, but particularly as these top notes, and then the next step will be as bottom notes, is we're creating a compound melody within our line. And that's gonna make your line sound more complex and more rich, because not only is there this one melody, but there's actually a second melody going on. So listen one more time, see if you can keep your ear on that compound melody. And this is really useful for pianists because we can just put it into our thumb is we can make the guide tone line our bottom notes. Okay, so again, it's forming that sense of a compound note. Now, I find this concept of using the third and seventh only both very limiting, and I think it's actually the wrong notes to use because when we're improvising, we often really like to find notes that aren't necessarily strongly in the chords, and the third and seventh are almost always gonna be in the chords. So often you can aim for more colorful notes. So the ninth and the fifth are kind of the logical next step, and what's fun with this is if we use some appropriate alterations, we can create this chromatic 
guide tone line. Um, so here's without any alterations, the fifth connecting to the ninth, connecting to the fifth. And that's beautiful as is. You can absolutely practice with that. But isn't it nicer with the fifth going to the flat nine, connecting to the fifth? I think it is. Or we have the ninth connecting to the sixth, connecting to the fifth. Oh, I think I have an error there. It looks like it says five. Flat 13, five. That should be a six. I'll fix that. Six. So it could be six to the nine. It could be nine going to the five, going to the nine. Or you can create this chromatic line, the ninth going to the flat 13. Or you can think of it as a sharp five if you want, even though it's going down, going to the nine. And you could practice these in the same way. Actually, if you look closely at this example right at the top of the page here where I was using the thirds and sevenths of the bottom notes, I actually used this ninth to flat thirteenth to fifth as the top notes. So you can see I started with a D, went to the D flat, and then went to C. Uh, and this is something that you can do, is you can actually have two guide tone lines together. And as pianists, oh, I'm sure there's some pianists and some non-pianists watching, but oftentimes these fit really nicely into hand positions, right? I'm basically using this hand position of and then improvising with that, and it's naturally putting that on the top and that on the bottom. So these fifths and ninths with some alterations can be very useful too. Now, going to this next page of notes is where I start to get excited and a little bit crazy. So it's also fun and I think useful to make upwards uh, ascending guide tone lines. So not just these traditional guide tone lines, but we go from the fifth to the sharp ninth to the seventh. And I told you that idea of half steps was gonna come back. Each of these is going to be connecting by half steps because half steps just have a great pull. Anything, as long as half steps resolve, or as long as you resolve something by half steps, it's going to sound resolved. Right? Or the root going to the sharp five, going to the third. Um, the seventh going to the sharp eleven, going to the ninth. But my personal favorite one, and this is. Uh, where I really start to light up is this one, the third of the minor chord, going to the major seventh of the dominant chord. We're not supposed to do that. But again, what I told you is that if something resolves by half step, it's gonna sound resolved. So even though that is not at all what generally needs on the F7, if we do it in the context of a guide tone line, then it will resolve, okay? And this might not be so obvious if you're looking at a transcription, but this is a great way to introduce some of these color notes. Right, because now we're thinking horizontally, so we can introduce tensions and then resolve them. I love this. If you're anything like me, that major seventh doesn't bother you at all on that dominant. Right, the truth is you can use any note on any chord. It's context that's important. And these guide tone lines do help to give you context. So then you can think, well, why do we only have to change notes once per chord, right? Couldn't we make guide tone lines that move more than once? And there are some kind of traditional jazz guide tone lines that move more than once per chord. Now, there might be some out there in jazz education world who might say, these aren't guide tone lines. Guide tone lines are this one certain thing. And uh, to that, I say, well, that's fine. Call them whatever you want, but these are helpful. <laughs> and they, to me, they do the same thing. They connect between chords by step, um, and we can improvise around them. So you've probably heard this. Uh, you know, like uh, it's in tenor madness. find it a bunch of other places in the jazz repertoire, none of which are particularly coming to mind at this point. But this one to the major seventh, to the four, to the three, 
And I love that because this is a wrong note. This is a wrong note, but put together. You get the bridge of confirmation, right? Just about. Pretty close. <laughs> um, you know, and I invented some more. Right, again, a nice way to use the major third against the minor chord. third or the sharp two on the B, B, B major, oh, on the B flat major seven. So there's so much to do with those. They're so fun to play around with. Um, and then, you know, if you really want to get naughty and you really want to do something complex, you can do a guy tone line in a hemiola. And again, people might say these aren't guy tone lines and that's fine. I don't really care. I think it's fun. So again, there's all these wrong notes in here, right? This E natural has no business. But it's resolving, so why not? And so I don't think it's essential to hit them exactly you know, just like we weren't hitting all the other guitar lines right on the downbeat, I don't have to play. Right. I could, but in jazz we don't really love this strict rhythmic pattern, so I like putting a little hiccup or a little hitch in there. At some point, I'm going to do a whole session about hemiolas because they really interest me too. Um, but I think there's a ton of possibilities to play around with all kinds of different rhythms in guy tone lines. So um, I hope that you've learned something new. I hope that it inspires you a little bit to play around with some of these concepts, figuring out how through forming kind of a horizontal linear approach, you can introduce some notes that you might not usually feel uh, comfort comfortable introducing as well as how you can form some of these more uh, complex, sophisticated compound melodies in your bebop improvisation. I'm um, sorry, I'm gonna go back to my front camera. Uh, but thank you very much for watching. Please feel free to put any questions or requests in the comments. Of course, like and subscribe. And of course, jeremysiskin.com is the best place to buy playing solo jazz piano. Uh, so until next time, I'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.